Good evening and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Pride and Prejudice in its Third Century. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Nicholas Dames from Columbia University. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. And it uh, it's it's sort of bittersweet, actually. Tonight is our last webinar for the 2019-20 school year. We've done 40 this year, this series, uh, all of which are recorded and you can find on our website and go back and revisit some of our previous sessions. But I want to take a moment to thank you not only for uh, attending tonight's session, but in many cases, uh, attending multiple sessions. I think we counted, I asked Libby to count, and we had something like 50 different teachers who had attended over 20 webinars this year. Uh, which is just remarkable that um, that you find this as valuable and relevant as we hope you do. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. I, I know all of us are a little bit goggle-eyed from uh, working through our laptops and video conferences, but I think this will be a wonderful way to end the series. Uh, and of course, this is um, a rebroadcast or a rescheduling from several weeks ago. So I'm doubly pleased that we're able to bring this to you. Um, I usually thank Libby and Mike for their hard work in our education department, but I'm going to again take the moment to reflect on the last year um, and thank them both for uh, the work they've done, not only in our online work, but in the face-to-face -face programming and in the curricular decisions that we've made. Um, I think we serve something close to 7,500, 7,500 educators in different ways through our webinar series, and Libby is our primary contact for not just uh, marketing and promoting them, but also working with our scholars to develop the PowerPoints and the planning and the readings that many of you have taken advantage of. And Mike is building slowly but surely a uh, just a wonderful suite of online courses. I would encourage uh, all of you to consider taking a course this spring, this summer, next fall. Uh, those courses earn a lot more credit than these webinars do, and they're intended to have the same emphasis of collaborative work with scholars and subject matter experts. <clears throat> the center, as many of you know, just like your organizations and schools, has been closed for nearly two months now. You, you can't visit us physically, but you can visit us online. Uh, please take a moment to go to our website and make sure you're signed up for our, our listserv. That's where we send most of the announcements of new opportunities, but you can also continue to explore our content. That's the scholarly content that our fellows and other scholars have created, as well as the education materials that we have available. And the most, most uh, useful um, part of the navigation bar is the search function. So right now, if you go and type in Jane Austen, you'll find uh, eight other opportunities to uh, call content and bring that into the work that you do in your classroom. I also want to, this is, you can see the theme tonight is our last one. This is our, our thanks episode. I do want to thank our teacher advisory council for an incredibly hard year of work in what has become a incredibly disrupted year. Uh, this year's TAC number 20 educators from around the country, and we've asked them and invited them to contribute to our work in a variety of ways. Um, consider this as you might think about joining a cohort in the future, including next year. Uh, we ask their support and their advice on any kind of curriculum choices that we make, materials we develop, uh, programs that we put together. Um, we ask them to TA many of our webinars. That includes uh, Camille Bernstein, who's with us tonight from uh, her hometown just outside of Boston. And as the TA, what we'll ask her to do tonight and our TAs to do each session is to be in the chat box to ask questions, maybe respond with some thoughts about the pedagogy behind uh, these topics and share any kinds of resources that might make the content of the webinar more applicable to your classroom. Uh, other roles and, uh, and requests have included advocating at both the state and the local level, presenting at conferences, and getting first choice, VIP choice, of attending any of our online or summer programming. Um, if any of you would like to join next year's council, we'll be accepting applications until May 22nd, and I would love to, uh, to see your name come across our, uh, our application pool. Uh, I also want to give you some uh, sneak peek, a snapshot of what next year brings. Um, frequently at this point in the webinar, I like to remind you of, uh, of things that are coming up uh, very soon, but I'm going to turn our attention to next year, 2021. Let's assume, let's all cross our fingers that school, uh, while it will never be the same, is at least a little bit more stable in terms of the environment that you're able to provide to your students and probably your kids. Uh, we will have a whole new suite of online courses available starting in the fall. These include, include titles like Understanding the Modern Middle East, Teaching Visual Literacy in the Humanities Classroom, 
The Myths of Ancient Africa, Women's Voices in the Classics, and Land Rights and Water Access. Um, these courses will be uh, offered side by side with the current five to six courses that we have, and we'll be rotating them in a catalog of courses that give you a lot of choices uh, with timing and with uh, the, the time that you can spend on them. Our webinar series next year will kick off on September the 10th. Uh, we've got 40 new sessions that have already been scheduled. You'll see these on our website probably by Memorial Day or 1st of June. Um, there's a wide variety of topics and uh, wonderful speakers and scholars. Um, we'll be starting the season with the 9-11 Oral History Project and then throughout the year we'll be exploring lots of different compelling topics and ways that the humanities can help us make sense of this ever uh, an increasingly complicated world. Um, we will likely be opening our registration in mid to late August. And this year we might try a little something different in terms of registration. I think one of the things that we've, we've seen happen is that when we announce the registration for the year, um, it's very tempting and, and many educators with all of the best intentions go in and sign up for multiple sessions all at once um, and then are unable to attend many of the sessions they sign up for, but it also takes a registration slot, slot for someone else. So this year we might stagger it a little bit and make sure that everybody has opportunities to sign up for the webinars that they find to be relevant and interesting for their teaching. Um, I do uh, encourage you to keep an eye out on our website and our email. So we'll be announcing the registration and the full slate of speakers very soon. And then finally, I'm uh, even more excited to announce that on June the 1st, we'll be opening the Humanities in Class Digital Library. Uh, this is a open education resource and OER platform. It will be free and available to educators at any level. And this will be a place where you can access all of the materials that we've made at the center, as well as uh, resources, content, scholarship, and instructional materials from over 30 organizations uh, across the humanities fields. That includes uh, great organizations like the Jane Austen Summer Program at UNC, as well as New American History. I see Annie Evans here in the room tonight. Uh, this is a space uh, that you might think of as a maker space, a laboratory, where you can access materials, you can uh, save them, you can remix them, you can publish your own work, you can com communicate and be in community with teachers uh, across the country. And we will be sending you information on how to get a library card very soon. Again, this is free. It's open, uh, it will never cost you anything, but it is a space you can be much more interactive with our materials rather than just go, going to our website and downloading what you might find interesting. So this will be uh, what we're calling a soft launch on June the 1st, and then a big grand opening in August. Uh, we'll also have several tutorial webinars next, early next fall on how to really maximize the resource, the repository, and get the most out of it. I hope all of you uh, sign up for library cards when the time comes. So thank you for bearing with me as I gave thanks and maybe some new announcements. Our webinar tonight, however, is really intended to focus on Nicholas Dames and his expertise in uh, all things Jane Austen. Uh, as a reminder, the conversation tonight will be audio only and will be associated with a PowerPoint that's been developed. Uh, hopefully you found the readings uh, interesting and they will definitely be brought to the conversation. Um, also, the chat box is going to be a big way to add to this conversation. So if you have questions or thoughts, uh, please do uh, register them in the chat box. As the moderator, I'll bring them to uh, Professor Names. We'll try to incorporate those in a conversation. And Camille Bernstein is also going to be there to help uh, just underneath in the back channel to keep the conversation going and connect it to the classroom. Uh, let's see. I'm going to take just a moment, Nicholas. I'm going to find you in my long roster of attendees uh, under N, not D. And I will. Turn your microphone on. Hey there, Professor, can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? I can, thank you for being patient. I wanna thank you personally for being so flexible with us. Of course, when we scheduled this several weeks ago, it was the first time in the history of this series that my home internet uh, decided to not work. So I really do appreciate you rejoining us and coming back for this conversation. It's not a problem. I mean, as uh, as I'm sure has happened to everybody in recent weeks, uh, you know, we've all, we've all had our, our issues in adjusting to uh, sort of new reality. Yeah, well, great. So I've given you the mouse and I'm gonna invite you to lead the conversation, but but I'd actually like to start, if you don't mind, with a, a quick question, a personal question actually, that might frame tonight. And and honestly, I'm just anxious to get your, your opinions and thoughts about this. 
Um, a couple of nights ago, we had a webinar session uh, that really focused on the ways that the classics and the writings and readings of antiquity can help us better understand grief and loss today. Hmm. Uh, one of our speakers uh, was Richard Fontaine. He's the brother of Mike Fontaine, who is the lead speaker. He's a classic professor at Cornell. And he, Richard, had uh, just published an op-ed in which he discussed the role of fiction in responding to crises. And his argument was that, you know, it's so important to be able to think uh, creatively and to imagine and have empathy through fiction. So I'm curious from your point of view, Professor, if, again, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, how do you feel that fiction has helped you respond to contemporary events? That may be Jane Austen, it may be other, but as a, as a literary scholar, as someone who is you know, well-versed in, in wordcraft and literature, how can we activate that for this really crazy world we're living in now? It's a it's an excellent question, and it's 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 a huge one because um, you know I, I uh, the first thing I'll say is I think that and, and I've I've really been puzzling over this myself. It's you know part of the reason I'm taken by your questions is something I've been thinking quite a bit about in the in recent weeks, and you know I I've really found myself in recent weeks. Um, feeling that the fiction I'm reading is giving me access to, I wouldn't even say, I mean, it, it's not exactly information that I don't possess, but it really is ways of putting that information into context that was not available for me before. Wait, you know, giving me frames of, of, of experience that in, in a day-to-day -day basis, I'm, I'm, I'm prone to overlook or, you know, I'm too steeped in, just dealing with, particularly with this recent emergency on a, in a day-to-day -day way. And I've found fiction, you know, particularly I'm, I've been reading fiction, you know, somewhat intentionally about states of emergency. Mm -hmm. And it's given me ways to really put into some wider context what seems to be happening to all of us right now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been reading a lot of fiction recently, for instance, about uh, displacement and uh, you know, sitting here in New York City, where it feels like at least half of the people I know have fled uh, in recent weeks, and uh, it looks like that will continue for some time. It's it's interesting. It's important for me to put this not just in the sense of you know some friends of mine have vanished, but uh, how does this fit into other kinds of displacement during situations of emergency? And that it feels like is one of the things that fiction is really good at is providing you those long-term context in which to to place your present experience yeah that's a great answer thank you for for indulging me it's um you know as, as we work through the topic tonight in some ways it's a really nice break from talking about pandemics and disease and the state of the world on the other hand um it's just a reminder for me that fiction does provide those training wheels just as you suggest to uh, have empathy for and sort of understand situations in a better way. And I hope all of our uh, participants tonight, whether they teach literature or not, see that that fiction can be a really powerful tool for responding to what we're going through. Yeah, and 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 you know, just as a way of of turning to Austin because I think Austin's a particularly interesting case in this. Um, she there's a long history of people reading Austin in states of emergency, and it's an interesting history because it it seems to it seems to happen in two different ways. There's a famous anecdote uh, about uh, Winston Churchill um, during, I think this was 42, so after the worst of the Blitz, but um, nonetheless in a pretty dark period of the war, who, uh, when he personally developed pneumonia and was, was quite ill, I mean, ill to the, to the point that there was some real concern whether he was gonna make it, took to reading all of Austin. That was his bedtime reading, and he writes about it in his letters, and what he writes is very interesting. He writes that it's the perfect escape. Um, he has a long letter about Austin in which he says what, you know, what placid lives these people had, how little they had to worry about compared to what we're coping with now, and you know, how serene their existence was, and it really took me out of myself and was curative. Um, and that is one way in which people have described the effect of reading Austin in a state of emergency, but there's an entirely different way. And, and I, I highly recommend a great uh, short story by Rudyard Kipling called The Jainites. And it's about a company of, of English troops in World War I in the trenches remembering their Jane Austen reading and discussing it with each other. 
and having it kind of bond the company to the point where they're naming some of their artillery pieces after characters from Pride and Prejudice. I, I, I think, in fact, uh, they name one of their cannons Mr. Collins because it makes a lot of noise but doesn't do a whole lot. And uh, <laughs> the the reason is not because they think of Austin as an escape, but because they think of Austin as somebody who understands what they're going through. Because they understand Pride and Prejudice as itself already wartime literature. And that, you know, Kipling understands Austin as somebody who's writing, Pride and Prejudice is set during wartime. Now, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit and, and the ways in which that's uh, not foregrounded by Austin. But uh, the sense of Austin is really tough-minded and really able to understand states of emergency. Very different than, say, Churchill's reaction, but both of those reactions have seemed like things that, that uh, ways people have understood reading Austin in a situation like the one we're in now. Um, That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've given you the mouse. Thank you for taking a little bit of a sideways detour, but maybe it's not so sideways. And uh, now we're anxious to hear you walk us through this tonight's conversation. Sure. So, you know, I just, I have here as an introduction, um, uh, essentially what was, uh, you know, in, in the, the description of the webinar already. Um, and uh, I, my interest today is, or tonight is just going to be about essentially, you know, stemming from what I just said, ways of trying to understand what Austin, uh, how Austin reads to us now, ways to think about her now, and in negotiating this, divide that always seems to exist around her between the sense that her world is kind of impossibly distant from ours, so different in so many ways, and conversely, the ways in which it seems so remarkably similar. Um, and trying to figure out ways to to square those two accounts, I think, will be really the, the burden of what I want to say. Um, this is, uh, I'll give you a, a sense of it here from two people uh, writing at roughly the same moment, the late 20s and the late 30s. Uh, Virginia Woolf uh, writing about, uh, apropos of Austin, um, the feeling that I think a lot of students have about Austin, that this, the, the lives of the characters described here are very minor lives. It's nothing, nothing that exciting. These are, uh, you know, these are marriages being worked out. Um, these are drawing rooms. This isn't, this isn't the battlefield. And, uh, you know, Wolf's uh, argument here is that that is a scale of value that, in fact, Austin throws into question. On the other hand, you have someone like Auden writing a poem in the late 30s in which he has a very different sense of, of Austin. He, he calls her shocking. Um, shocking because, as you know, as he, he puts it in these, these great uh, sort of consciously multisyllabic lines. Uh, he's, you know, it makes me most uncomfortable to see an English spinster of the middle class describe the amorous effects of brass, reveal so frankly and with such sobriety the economic basis of society. So again, I think it's that it's that uh, it's that difference maybe between the sense of of the serenity of Austin even if it's one that Wolf wants to put some pressure on, and the real hard-headed realism of Austin. And it's a, a kind of realism that I think we, for various reasons, can, can perhaps identify with. Now, I, the problem, uh, just to say a bit about the problem that often faces teachers were when they're teaching Austin in, in a classroom of, of younger people, you know, the main problem is that she's going to be over-familiar to some students. They're, they're going to already have read her or they'll know her by reputation, often through some of the film versions, um, and they'll already have a set opinion about her in that regard. Or she will be totally unknown um, to others. Although I think less and less the case, frankly, particularly in the last 20 years, but uh, the case will be that, you know, a, a large degree of the students will already have a set opinion about her, that opinion will fairly predictably tend to break down along gender lines. There will be a kind of identification or disidentification, you know, either proud identification or or a kind of derisive disidentification with something that students, certainly my students, do identify as chiclet or romance. Um, and there will be a kind of fight that you know is is incipient in the classroom about whether these genres are worthwhile or not. Um, I mean, I think that's in some ways an interesting discussion, but in other ways, I think it really misses the boat. 
it, it really misses, first of all, it misses Austin's irony. It misses so much of her ethical seriousness. And even, I think, and it's something I'll be concentrating on more and more tonight, is her political adventurousness. Those things tend to drop out of that discussion. But it does go back to this, this central problem I've been describing. Um, and I, I thought I'd put a couple of quotes here from Lionel Trilling, the post-war critic who taught at my institution. Trilling wrote about Austin frequently in his career. And the reason I put these two quotes on here is because I, I wanted to show you how he could never make up his mind about one thing in particular. Um, he wrote a number of essays about what it was like to teach Austin. And uh, the first time he wrote about this in 1954, he says, uh, well, there, you know, there are so many people who still read Austin, and this is actually fairly remarkable for someone who wrote in you know, essentially the first uh, decade or two of the 19th century. Um, remarkable, but he says understandable because uh, the novels of Jane Austen are in essential ways of our modern time. That is, she's describing a world that we still live in, in, in its essentials. He returns to this question uh, about 19 years later, in which he finds himself saying the exact opposite. This is a great essay called Why We Read Jane Austen, which starts uh, by his talking about him teaching a lecture class on Austen in I think the 73, 74 year, and finding it oversubscribed, finding him mobbed. And he's stunned by this. He doesn't understand exactly why people are still reading Austen in the early 70s. And he says his, his conclusion there is, well, it's essentially escapism. He says it's it's uh, Jane Austen is he says congenial to the modern person who feels himself ill accommodated by his own time. Uh, that is that it's just not wanting to live in the modern world that reads that leads you to Jane Austen. I think this you know this will will keep coming back to this dichotomy, but it kind of guides the way I'm going to work tonight in one way in that I'm going to be dipping into from time to time some bits of context real uh, sort of particular historical context about the world that Pride and Prejudice comes out of, which will seem in some ways very different than we might expect and different than our world now. But I think in the process of identifying what's so different, and in some cases what's almost hidden about the novel, we do then begin to see some similarities, some analogies to our own time, which might help us understand what she's up to and why her relevance is, is as great as ever right now. Um, so, uh, just to say a, a, a bit more about my approach before I jump in, um, I will be saying a bit about, you know, and I think this is inevitable with Austin, what isn't there in Austin? What isn't mentioned? Uh, what is, what is deliberately occluded by Austin? You know, the, the thing about Austin that one has to show students is that there are really different ways about in which a novel or any literary text can be about something. And I think the thing that I often lead with with students is this claim that not everything a novel is about is really announced openly. And that's particularly the case in Austin where so much about the world she's writing about is very tacit. And so there does need to be a little bit of work to excavate some of the things that, that have kind of gone silent for us. But this is, this is a novel, Pride and Prejudice, that's about the problem of change, uh, social change in particular, but also about changing our minds. That is, it's, it's in many ways a story about mental transformation and how mental transformation might relate to social transformation. Uh, it's also, and I think you know, this needs to be really foregrounded and, and talked about in, in multiple ways, it's about the everyday. It's, it's about the private. And the, the private or the everyday world is really accorded in Austin an almost philosophical importance. It's as if the novel is asking about what is the heroism of everyday acts and, and private individuals. Um, and that private individuals here often means females, right? But what about the decisions we make on an everyday basis? Uh, those that, you know, those decisions that seem like they just pertain to us, um, including that question, who are we going to marry for, for a young person? And, and how do those decisions matter or ramify beyond us, that take us outside of us in, in some way? So let me, let me start then by just saying a bit about Austin's, uh, Austin's life as a, way, as a way in to this. 
Um, she is, as I've said here, the seventh of eight children of uh, a vicar in a very small town in Hampshire called Steventon. Uh, her father, George Austin, was a, was a well-educated uh, clergyman, but, but somewhat poor, actually. Um, so he had, to, he had side businesses to help make ends meet. He ran a, a small boarding school, essentially out of his home, uh, and did some farming on the side. But because he ran this small boarding school, he had a, a library. Uh, for his young students. And it was that library that uh, Jane in particular was allowed to browse through pretty freely. It wasn't a, a big library, but it was, you know, it was what the British call a kind of select library, a very, very good one. Uh, and she seems to have been in that sense, almost a kind of autodidact. She was really not formally educated um, beyond, uh, you know, I, my, my, memory here is a little vague, but I think beyond uh, the age of 11, she wasn't formally educated any longer. Although she seems to have been, I suppose we would now say homeschooled by her father even after that date. And her father did educate her brothers. And as I said, you know, took on students for extra income. Um, her mother, uh, Cassandra, seems to have had some aristocratic connections, but this is by no means an aristocratic family. Uh, Although her, you know, the, the fortunes of her siblings were quite varied. Um, her eldest brother went into the clergy, just like her father had gone into the clergy. Um, her brother Henry went into banking. One brother went into the Navy. Um, but the key moment of her life is the death of her father when she's 30. Now, this, is, this, this period of her life uh, in her late 20s and 30s is a period of really profound dislocation. Um, shortly before he dies, he retires, um, and and rather unpredictably, when when he retired, of course, he has to give up the rectory. So they have to move. They move to Bath, uh, a large town, uh, one that Austin initially certainly did not uh, find at all congenial. And she's you know she's dislocated from home then, and at, at that point, her father dies, and this sends uh, her and her mother and her sister Cassandra into a several year period of you know, it, it wouldn't be too much to say something like homelessness. Um, they are essentially living by making prolonged visits to friends and relatives for a number of years. They have no home of their own. They have very little income. Uh, until finally, uh, in 1809, uh, one of her brothers, uh, her brother Edward, um, who had been, in, in a fairly complicated story, had been essentially adopted by legally adopted by a local uh, family of local gentry, comes into possession of a rather enormous estate in uh, Chawton, a small town not that far from her birthplace in Steventon, and gives his mother and two sisters a small cottage to live in. And that cottage still exists. It's now the Jane Austen Museum. Um, you can go see it, and I'll, I'll show you a picture in a bit of that cottage. Um, and it's there that she actually starts her literary career proper, um, that she starts writing new fiction, including and publishing some things that she had written when she was much younger. But she has published nothing before she moves to Chawton. We do have a lot of her juvenilia. And I think it's really important to note that her juvenilia is really unique. Um, it is largely parodic. She's writing parodies of contemporary novels from the time that she's at least 11 and possibly younger. Um, it, the, the dates of her juvenile are not entirely certain, so she might have been writing these parodies as early as nine or 10, and they're savagely funny. Um, she really doesn't write anything autobiographical or confessional when she's young, which is you know, highly unusual for young people. What she seems to be doing is, is really mastering the rules of how to write novels at her moment and mastering those rules by making fun of them. So she does seem to have, from a very young age, this, this really kind of, you know, wicked wit. And, uh, uh, you know, we would think of her now almost as the kind of, you know, sarcastic preteen who, who finds everything it, it is that adults do really pretty funny. And that is, uh, you know, that continues into her mature work. But Pride and Prejudice, I should add, she starts writing, uh, she has a complete first draft of it when she's 21. So it's, it's in many ways a young person's novel. Um, its initial title was called First Impressions. Now, she sets it aside for a number of years and only returns to it 
in 1811, 1812. Um, that is, you know, she's much older at this point. She's been through a lot. Um, she's at this point decisively unmarried, but at least has a home uh, with her mother and sister Cassandra. And she revises it pretty thoroughly. So we don't have the manuscript to first impressions. We don't really know what it was like. We don't know what she preserved or the extent to which she totally overhauled it. There's uh, some evidence that the initial form of the novel was epistolary, that it was a novel in letters, like so many fictions in the 18th century, and that when she revises it, she uh, removes the epistolary frame and she writes it through this omniscient narrative voice, which I'll say a bit about in a bit. Um, as I, she dies young, and I'll, I'll you know, I, that is uh, both, I think, a, a real tragedy, but also in some sense, uh, serves almost to kind of guarantee her canonicity. That is, it, you know, it's not that hard to read all of Austen. Six novels and some juvenilia and, uh, you know, some unfinished pieces. It's very easy to feel like you have mastered Austen, which I think has had a lot to do with her uh, continuing reputation. Um, Professor, if, if yeah. I can ask a quick, quick question. Um, you've mentioned uh, some of these collections, are, are you aware of, or in your opinion, what's the best uh, archive or digital environment to find these kinds of uh, collections? Um, so digitally, um, that's a good question. You know, I wish, I, I'm not sure about digital collection. So there's, I will recommend there's a very recent uh, paperback put out by Oxford University Press called Teenage Writings. And it's, it's you know, because it's an Oxford World Classics volume, so it's cheap. Um, that, you know, it just was, it just came out, I believe, for the uh, bicentenary of her death. So three years ago now. Mm -hmm. And it's excellent. It contains everything. Uh, it's been beautifully edited by one of the, really one of the more famous Austenians we now have. Um, I don't know if those are as fully available online. I wish I did. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you to Camille for our TA tonight for adding the Amazon link for the book you just mentioned. Yep. Thank you. No, that's great. It, it, it's you know it's it's worth it to see where you know where she uh, where she starts in a sense, and and how you know how intensely precocious she was. It's something that um, she deserves. You can't say too much about. I, I, you know, I, I say quite often to my students, the thing about writing novels is it's really not a young person's game. And so that we don't, we don't really speak of novel writing prodigies. Uh, it's not the kind of situation where, you know, uh, six-year-olds write novels um, in, the, in the same way that, you know, Mozart composed symphonies. It, it's, it's very much an older person's uh, yeah. art form. You know, you have to mature into it. But to the extent that there's ever been something like a novel writing prodigy, I think Austin was one. She just seems to have understood how to do it right from the start. Um, let me say a bit though, let me turn to money as a backdrop to understanding what happens in this novel. Um, so, and, and to place Austin in relation to the, to the world she's writing about. Um, so here's a, a kind of taxonomy of the landowning classes. So I've left out here an enormous amount of the population that is a population in Britain that doesn't own land. But I wanted to taxonomize for you the landowning population to give you a sense because it's actually you know largely landowners that make up Austin's world. And there is this kind of threefold distinction between the what I've called great landlords, of whom there are very few. You know, I, a good estimate is something like 400 across Great Britain at this period of time, but who do own an, an, an enormous amount of percentage of the overall land. Um, and you have uh, Mr. Darcy and Lady Catherine de Bourgh belong to that stratum, as does her brother Edward eventually, after he's uh, been legally adopted by this family called the Knights. Then you have the gentry. Um, a rather large proportion of the landowning population, and it's here these you know, these really careful distinctions that you need to keep in mind um, between the very wealthy gentry like Mr. Bingley, um, who's really kind of a, an Ari beast in certain ways. His his uh, family had acquired their money from trade, uh, that is, that they from farther down the social scale. But he's now got enough money to kind of buy his way into the landed class. Um, but wealthier certainly than the Bennett family. And I've put here Jane Austen's own family, which I think it's important to note would have been less well off even than the Bennets. Um, 
but to give you a sense also of the precarity of the Bennett family, I think it's really important to note here is that um, this is a family that is really precariously genteel, and the gentility seems like it will only last as far as the father's life lasts. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a second. But um, you know, it's, students will often ask, they'll say something like, well, why does there have to be five daughters in this family? Um, seems like five is too many. Some of them we don't even know that well. Why couldn't there have just been like two or three? And the answer to this one is, is, you know, is entirely economic. It's pretty clear why there are five daughters in the family, and that's because Mr. and Mrs. Bennett kept trying because they were continually trying to get a male child to produce an heir, and eventually failed at it and, and gave up. Um, so there's a there's a real realism to the fact that there are five daughters here. The reason, um, and it's one that I think really has to be explained to students if they're going to understand the mechanics of the novel is uh, this fairly abstruse uh, element of English land law called entail. Um, but let me, I'll get to entail in a second. Let me say a bit about uh, how to put the income ranges of these families into contemporary contexts for students to give, you a to give them a sense of the real disparity here. Sometimes students will think that there's not much difference between the Bennetts and say, Mr. Darcy. Um, but here, I think, you know, doing uh, some conversions, you begin to get a sense of the, the scale of the difference. Um, the dowries that Mr. Bennett has been able to set uh, aside for each daughter amounts to something like uh, $16,000 a year in income. Now, you can explain to students what that means, income. It means that there's an investment, um, probably in government funds that has been made, and that investment pays something like 5% a year in the early 19th century, or late 18th century. Um, so you can extrapolate out as to what the sum total of that investment would be, but they have about $16,000 a year to live on in, in contemporary US dollars should the father die. That is, they're essentially, um, or almost like one would say not quite destitute, but close to it. Um, and then you begin to look at the scales of the people they're mingling among to the point that um, if you do the conversion with Darcy's income figures that, that uh, are learned about very early in the novel, he's living on something like $800,000 a year and would have something on the order of $150 million in assets. Um, so there's, there's an enormous gap that is uh, between these two families. And I think that's a, you know, important to grasp from the outset to give a sense of scale. Um, Austin's lifetime earnings from all four novels that she published before her death amounted to here um, 684 pounds, which would be something like $60,000, you know, uh, in contemporary uh, US dollars, not inconsiderable, but by no means a living, uh, particularly over the number of years, I think it was something like seven years that she was uh, writing. But to go back to the entail for a second. So what this means, and the uh, Sandra McPherson article did a very good job, I think, of, of uh, describing the deep background of this. But it's a state of land ownership in which the present owner of the land doesn't own it absolutely. This was something called fee simple. By owning it absolutely, that meant you had the right to dispose of it however you chose. You could sell it. You could uh, leave it in your will to pretty much whomever you wanted. Um, but in entail, you didn't have that right. You were essentially a kind of a trustee over the land, um, in, in English law called the um, grantee, actually. And you were prevented by law from what was called alienating the land by selling it or by disposing of the property in your will. The land, in fact, by what was called operation of law, had to pass to the nearest male descendant. Obviously, in the case of the Bennett family, that male descendant is not in the immediate family, right? So it's this distant cousin, Mr. Collins, this clergyman who will be the heir. Um, at this point, that is set in stone. You know, the Mr. and Mrs. Bennett are past the childbearing years. And so uh, the land, the, the house and the land they live on is not theirs, is, uh, or is only theirs for as long as the father lives. This produces a real pressure on the daughters to find some sort of economic safety net for themselves, which would only be locatable in marriage. 
Um, now, the, you know, there's a, there's a real paradox around entail that I think it's it's important to have in your mind, and that that the Sandra McPherson piece is is very good at sketching, which is that entail can seem really unfair uh, from one perspective because it, it absolutely protected primogeniture. It that is, it protected the male line, and so it could really be understood as hostile to women's interests and uh, to the ability of women to maintain themselves. Um, and that's exactly how Mrs. Bennett understands it. Uh, in her complaining about the entail, she certainly understands it as, uh, she wouldn't have used these words, but one would say sort of uh, uh, patriarchal. But, and here's the, the interesting paradox in this, it, you know, the entail also meant something itself somewhat anti-patriarchal, which is that it means that even the men here have to kind of surrender their will. They can't do with their property what they want to do with it. So they have to understand ownership as this arrangement that is going to last beyond their lifetime. And that is, they have to understand their will is limited. So in certain ways, that actually safeguards women, oddly enough in certain circumstances. Now, not, of course, directly the Bennett daughters who are really put into some peril by this. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's a re it's not quite the case, I think, to say that Austin is hostile to the idea of entail. She's interested in exploring the circumstances of it. But the immediate circumstances for the Bennett daughters, of course, is it, it does create this uncertainty around them. If they can't find a suitable marriage, one that is that can maintain them economically for the rest of their lives, there really is this kind of problem about how they will maintain themselves, which incidentally was exactly a kind of problem that Austin herself had faced with the death of her father. Overall, though, what I want to say about this financial landscape I'm sketching is that it's very much the world that we increasingly live in. So, um, I found it very interesting when uh, Thomas Piketty wrote his strangely best-selling uh, tome, Capital in the 21st Century. He continually goes back to Jane Austen as an illustrative example of the kind of economic landscape that we now live in. Um, and uh, he calls it a, you know, a world in which inherited capital increasingly has an enormously disproportionate power over income from labor. And so this this uh, second quote here, I think, really captures what he what he sees as a similarity between Austin's world and our own. Uh, he says a, a, a society in which income from inherited capital predominates over income from labor at the summit of the social hierarchy. That is a society like those described by Balzac and Austin. Two conditions must be satisfied. First, the capital stock, and within it, the share of inherited capital must be large. Typically, the capital income ratio must be on the order of six or seven, and most of the capital stock must consist of inherited capital. The second condition is that inherited wealth must be extremely concentrated. The top centile of the inheritance hierarchy must by itself claim the lion's share of inherited wealth. Um, this might help explain something that I think students sometimes find puzzling about Austin, but when they stop and think about the similarities, they begin to see that it's actually very familiar to their sense of the way the world increasingly operates. What they find initially off-putting is of course, the obvious fact that no one in Pride and Prejudice works. Um, that's not entirely true. There are people with occupations at the margins of this novel. Um, the, uh, the relatives of the Bennett family, the gardeners, um, we know of a lawyer in town. There's some people at the very, very fringes of the, of the novel that have occupations, but not any of the major characters. They live off of rent. Um, that is, they live off of interest income, uh, rent from land they own. Um, and that is because that is really the only form. You know, income from capital, presumably from inherited capital, is the only form of income that allows you to exist in anything like the kind of gentlemanly strata of society. Uh, once you're making your income from labor, you've already fallen down the social hierarchy. And there's a way, there's a sense in Austin, just as there increasingly is a sense around us now, that you know, labor income means you just simply can't keep up. Um, you're condemned to a very, very marginal position compared to those who've managed to inherit their capital. So that again, it, you know, accentuates the, the real precarity of, of the Bennett family. 
given that what they might have inherited really isn't even theirs. Um, the other thing here, aside from money, just to, to sketch it at the beginning, is, is uh, the political or geopolitical situation that Austin's describing. It's not quite clear when Pride and Prejudice is set exactly, um, partly because, of course, it was written at two different moments. It's safe to say it's written in, you know, it's set, I should say, in either something like the 1790s or the first few years of the 19th century. But in another sense, that doesn't matter because uh, in both those times, uh, England is at war, Britain's at war with France. And that means that you have highly militarized society. It's really worth paying, getting your students to pay attention to the fact that, and it's pivotal for the plot, there is a militia encamped in town for much of this novel and asking them why they think that is the case. Why are there so many army officers walking around flirting with girls and so forth? Um, well, there are a number of reasons for it, um, but primarily because of the perceived threat and, and the perception was not entirely incorrect of imminent invasion from France. Um, that is that the militias were mobilized to guard the south of England against uh, a threat of French invasion. Those militias ch had changed throughout the 18th century and they changed in the ways that Austin is writing about actually. So initially these would have been local militias. That is they would have been militias levied from the male population of the surrounding county. But that's not the case in Pride and Prejudice because the, the militias changed over the 18th century. And in fact, now you had militias that were raised in kind of non-specific, non-geographically specific ways. And what that means is the militia in Meriton and Longbourn is populated by people nobody knows, by strangers, strangers like Wickham. So that these are officers from all across England who are finding themselves in this town and the question that arises in the novel, how you know how to judge anybody uh, when you don't know really what they, where they come from any longer, what their background is. The other thing the militia is there for, it's worth saying, is to prevent civic unrest. Um, this is a time of great uh, political unrest, socioeconomic unrest, and the militia is there partly to cow the local population, to keep it in line. Now, this is really, really tacit in Pride and Prejudice, but there are moments where it creeps in. Um, here's a moment where uh, Kitty and Lydia have been walking around town sort of spying on the, on the militia and their doings. And uh, you get this, this line, um, much had been done and much had been said in the regiment since the preceding Wednesday. Several of the officers had dined lately with their uncle, a private had been flogged, and it had actually been hinted that Colonel Forster was going to be married. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, you know, there's a lot to say about the way in which a private had been flogged is just kind of dropped into the middle of that sentence is this, this clause that uh, hints at something of the realities of military life that immediately gets kind of swamped for, for Kitty and Lydia by the, the question of, of the marriage of the, the regiment's colonel and so forth. But it, you know, it's allowed to peek through here. So, so it's a militarized landscape in many ways. Um, Austin was, uh, if I can go back for a second, Austin was proud of, of this novel, but in ways that I think are hard to read. These are a couple letters she writes to her sister Cassandra uh, shortly after the novel's publication, in which she, it's not quite clear, you know, she's making, she's making kind of jokes about her own achievement. Um, when she says the work is rather too light and bright and sparkling, it wants shade, it wants to be stretched out here and there with a long chapter of sense, if it could be had, if not of solemn specious nonsense. It's, you know, there's an irony here that's a little hard to read, um, but it shows you her awareness of her desire to keep these rather stark and uncomfortable realities about you know, socioeconomic precarity and the threat of invasion, as well as the a very real sense in which this is a town occupied by their own army. Keep those things 
a, a bit tacit, a bit in the shade, so that they're not immediately visible. Um, so that she won't she won't stress them overly, but of course they really do ground everything that this novel does. Um, let me just say one other thing before I get to uh, some some elements of Austin's style, and that's uh, Austin's status as an author in her lifetime. So on the left, you can see here the title page to her first published novel, Sense and Sensibility, and the uh, Attribution here is, is uh, by a lady. Um, that was the really the state of her publicity up until her death. So when Pride and Prejudice comes out, uh, it's published by the author of Sense and Sensibility. So it's important to know that her name was not attached to her writings uh, in any public way until after her death. Um, but this was but she did not adopt a pseudonym. Um, nor did she try to hide her gender. That is, it was understood that this was a female writer, but the, her identity was was not forthcoming. Um, and while this was something that she didn't want widely shared in her neighborhood, she, you know, her family and acquaintances did know that she was writing and did have a sense that she had written these novels. I think the most important thing to say about Austen's identity in relation to uh, in relation to her fiction, is this I think very true and rather well known claim that nobody like Jane Austen exists within Jane Austen's fiction. That is, you don't run into people within an Austen novel that are uh, extremely intelligent, you know, clever or sarcastic, unmarried middle aged women who write for a living or I write for a living is not quite right, but at least earn some income by writing. They don't exist in Austen's world. Um, so it almost seems like a condition of the world she writes about is her own invisibility. And that's an excellent premise with which to begin to talk about her tone. So one way I think I, I you know, I often like to start students off, and it's, it's, it's the way almost everybody does it, certainly, is by reading the first sentence of the novel and asking some questions about it. It's a you know far more puzzling sentence than it presents itself as, and I think students are, you know tend to very quickly once they read this slowly cotton on to how complicated this sentence is. Um, but you know quite famously, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a life. Uh, is a problematic claim for one reason above all, and that it's not quite clear who is saying that. You know, the, the question one would want to ask is who speaks this sentence? And uh, who might be saying this sentence if it's not the narrator? Who's the narrator here? And if you have a sense of who the narrator is, which I think it's kind of impossible to have, but if you think you do, what is the opinion you think they have about this claim that's being made in this opening sentence? This is, you know, this is Austenian irony, and it's, it's premised on the idea that the narrator, as, as a recognizable person, has kind of vanished. And instead, you have these sentences that hover, making a certain kind of claim, but it's not quite clear whether that, you know, that claim is something to be taken seriously or not. And it's not quite clear even the extent to which that claim bears out in the novel, right? One thing students will often say about this sentence is, well, that, that's actually Mrs. Bennett's opinion. That's, a, that's something Mrs. Bennett would say, which is not that far from the truth. But um, it is, it's not exactly in Mrs. Bennett's language. It's, it's not in her idiolect, I guess would be the only way to put it. Um, it's, it's presented as a, an aphorism, you know, an abstract truth. And yet a lot of pressure is put on it almost immediately. But that doesn't also mean, I think one wants to be careful about this, that this claim is necessarily wrong exactly. Um, it just is something that kind of hovers and that you need to keep returning to, to ponder whether or not it is true. And that seems to be true of every single truth claim in Austin, largely because this narrative, you know, the narrator isn't knowable. And I think this has a lot to do as, as you know, as D.A. Miller, writes about at length in the, in the piece I had signed, has everything to do with the fact that Austen herself does not include anybody like her in her own novels. 
Um, and that leads to a, an innovation that I think is, is really key to, to you know, very quickly summarize. And that's this very important stylistic fact about Austin, which is free and direct discourse. Um, I've given you a, a definition here um, that is, uh, you know, instances in which a character's speech, perceptions, or thoughts are reported in the narrator's voice, usually with some flavor of the character's words, but without explicit tagging of the discourse as that of the character. So you remove, let's say, the, the she said or he thought. And you can see how this works with uh, a sentence like this one. I've taken an actual sentence from volume one, chapter 18, and reconstructed what it would look like if it wasn't in free and direct discourse, right? So you have what would be far more uh, lucid. You have Elizabeth thought, what is attention, forbearance, and patience with Darcy is injury to Wickham. That's direct discourse. Remove the quotation marks, you have indirect discourse. Elizabeth thought that what was attention, forbearance, patience with Darcy was injury to Wickham. But that's not what Austin does. Free and direct discourse is the withholding of any tagging of this sentence so that it's not entirely clear if this sentence does indeed come from within Elizabeth's head or from the narrator or from some sort of complex combination of the two. Um, now, sometimes this is rather straightforward. So in this sentence, you have, you know, Bingley in free and direct discourse describing his reactions on meeting the Bennett daughters. And it's pretty clear this is Bingley's voice, right? It's got that, you know, this sort of um, slightly dim, but extremely well-meaning, cheerful tone to it. Um, he's a little empty-headed, but he's, you know, he's a, he's a good guy. Um, he's full of superlatives. Um, and uh, it's not quite clear if the superlatives are going to be all that long-lasting, but, you know, it's, this is pretty clear that this is Bingley who is speaking this, despite the fact that it's not tagged as such. So in that sense, what Free and Direct Discourse does is gives you somebody's private uh, way of speaking to themselves or their, their way of being in the world. But it can often be more complicated than that. So here, I think what often free and direct discourse does is it by showing you somebody's way of thinking and yet withholding the tagging, it very tacitly suggests the things that person doesn't see. So um, this is, you know, one would take a free and direct discourse of Elizabeth's point of view talking about how frustrated she is with Mr. Collins and how much attention Mr. Collins is paying to her at a particular dance. But the last sentence is really interesting here. Uh, uh, she owed her greatest relief to her friend, Miss Lucas, who often joined them and good-naturedly engaged Mr. Collins's conversation to herself. Good-naturedly is the tip-off that you're in free and direct discourse because that's how Elizabeth thinks about the fact that Charlotte Lucas is uh, trying to lead Mr. Collins away from her. Uh, she thinks that, you know, Charlotte's just trying to give her a little relief from this incredibly tedious guy and, uh, you know, give her a break from his attention and help her out a little bit. Of course, very shortly on, we learn that's not what's happening. This is Elizabeth missing something. And it's often the case in free and direct discourse, you catch the character in the act of not seeing what's going on under their very noses. Um, but it, you know, you have to read critically to understand that um, this is not, it's not in the narrator's perspective. The narrator is not asserting as a truth that Miss Lucas is good naturedly engaging Mr. Collins's conversation. That's Elizabeth's version of the truth, which will later be corrected. Charlotte's actually up to something at this moment, or at least somewhat self-interested here. Um, I, I will sometimes say to students that, uh, although none of them actually know this film anymore. Um, it's a great movie, though. It is, and I think it's, you know, it's this brilliant uh, literalization of what free and direct discourse looks like, but this film being John Malkovich uh, from 1999, in which uh, characters who uh, work in an office discover a small closet in the office, and if you enter the closet, what you've done is you've actually kind of entered the head of the actor, John Malkovich, and you get to, they have, there are these portals in this closet where you see, literally see through his eyes. Um, and that's how free and direct discourse works. You are inside the heads of these characters, but by being inside their heads, just the way the movie works, that doesn't mean that you, you abandon your critical perspective on what you're looking at. 
So your perspective is limited to what the character can see, and you are seeing it the way they see it, but you're still capable of saying, that's not right. Or I, I, I actually have a sense of what they're not taking in at this moment. I, I, I think they're, you know, I think they're making mistakes. Uh, I think they're, uh, you know, they're, I don't, I don't agree with their perception, or I find something comic in their perception. Uh, this is so, you know, this is D. A. Miller's uh, argument about free and direct style. Um, that is that, uh, you know, one way to put it. It, it's a certain achievement for Austin because it, it associates the state of being a character with making mistakes about the world. Character is really, you know, it, it's so firmly linked to being wrong about certain things. As opposed to this invisible narrative voice, which can see inside everybody's head and is never wrong per se, partly because they never actually assert anything in any sort of straight form. Um, everything, everything that they even seem to be asserting is already kind of ironized. Now, Miller's argument about this is, because, is that this is the only way in which somebody who comes from a social category that is associated with a certain kind of abjection, and that would be something like an unmarried woman in her you know, uh, late 30s, early 40s, uh, writing, you know, presumably almost for her own amusement. Um, a woman, you know, uh, someone like that has no social authority. But a way to write as if you did is through free and direct discourse by refusing to assert anything in your own name, by essentially willing a kind of invisibility to yourself, but looking in the heads of characters to see what it is they're not seeing. Um, so, you know, one good test uh, for this, and, and I think in many ways you could think about Pride and Prejudice as working through a series of test cases. I, I once had a, a teacher who said that Pride and Prejudice works like law school and that you start with very simple cases and work your way up to the more complex ones by the time the novel's over. And while it's not entirely simple, it's maybe more simple than some of the later ones, would be the question of why Charlotte uh, decides to get engaged to Mr. Collins. Um, now, you learn two things here, and I, I want to just say a bit about how you learn it in different ways. Um, you learn it first, you learn about Charlotte's attitude first through direct discourse, through her actually talking to Elizabeth about this. So at this moment, we've learned, you know, Jane has been a kind of hit with Mr. Bingley, and there, there's been a lot of flirtation, and there's a rumor that he might even propose soon. And Charlotte says, you know, I, I, I think this is good news. I, I'm very happy for Jane. Um, and I don't think there's any point to wait to learn more about him because as she says, uh, happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. If the dispositions of the parties are ever so well known to each other or ever so similar beforehand, it does not advance their felicity in the least. They always continue to grow sufficiently unlike afterwards to have their share of vexation. And it's better to know as little as possible the defects of the person with whom you are to pass your life. So there's this, you know, disillusioned uh, approach that Charlotte takes that we learn directly, right? In some ways, that's the simple version of it, because uh, you know you can find it amusing. Elizabeth actually refuses to even believe she's being serious and says, "I mean, like, surely you're kidding." To which Charlotte responds, "No, I'm I'm, I'm entirely serious." Then you have the second version of this, which is in free and direct discourse largely. And this is after she does get engaged to Mr. Collins, after Elizabeth has rejected him. Um, and it's an amazing paragraph. It, it raises a really complicated question and shows you that if in, you know, if in her direct speech, it seems to be easy to disagree with her, it's much harder to disagree with her presented in free and direct style. So, it starts by entering into her head by saying, here's what Charlotte was thinking. And then it takes an interesting swerve halfway through this paragraph because uh, you're never quite clear in this paragraph whether you're getting Charlotte's sentiments or, or the narrator's sentiments via Charlotte, you know, whether it's some sort of abstract truth claim that's being made. So you know, her reflections were in general satisfactory. Mr. Collins, to be sure, was neither sensible nor agreeable. His society was irksome, 
and his attachment to her must be imaginary. But still, he would be her husband. Without thinking highly either of men or matrimony, marriage had always been her object. It was the only provision for well-educated young women of small fortune, and however uncertain of giving happiness, must be their pleasantest preservative from want. This preservative she had now obtained, and at the age of 27, without having ever been handsome, she felt all the good luck of it. Now, um, you know, just to point out, sort of, you know, in some ways, the semicolon here is the, the thing that I really want to pay attention to, because you have what sounds like a fairly direct uh, description of, uh, of a character's thoughts. Without thinking highly either of men or matrimony, marriage had always been her object, semicolon. And then it seems like you're in free and direct discourse. It was the only provision for well-educated young women of small fortune. And the, the past tense was does seem to tip off that this is something that Charlotte thinks. And then, we, but here, you know, and however uncertain of giving happiness must be their pleasantest preservative from want. That almost sounds like a, a truth claim. Um, as if to say something like, look, the affinity you may or may not have, a woman may or may not have with her husband, is really a kind of beside the point. What marriage is, is an economic arrangement to preserve women from destitution. And that therefore, uh, happiness is something that is uh, a luxury. You know, it is only something that certain people can afford. Charlotte is very clear-eyed about this, you know, under this line of thinking. And so we'll understand that uh, she is not the kind who can afford that particular luxury. What she needs is pure sustenance. You can even, if you want, make a kind of argument about the word want in that sentence, right? Because it does echo the first sentence of the novel. Um, uh, you know, man of good fortune must be in want of a wife. There's a little bit of a pun even in that first sentence. To be in want of a wife can mean you're looking for one, but it can also simply mean you lack one. Um, want is, is a word that really has a kind of explosive tendency in Pride and Prejudice because it's a bit of a pun, right? It expresses desire, you want something, but it also expresses lack, um, something you don't have and you need. Uh, this is, you know, I've, I've, I've put this, uh, I've alluded to this article by Melina Mo here, um, which I think is a great one because it, it takes Charlotte's argument very seriously. Um, that there's a kind of feminism that Charlotte is offering the novel, and it's the feminism of the really disempowered, um, to say, you know, happiness is all very well and good, self-fulfillment sounds great, but it isn't what, um, from certain places in the social hierarchy, anyone can really begin to contemplate. Um, now, the question, you know, the question here is, is the one about happiness, and the meaning of it, the, the value of happiness. It's a very complex term in Austin. Is it something that refers to the outward circumstances of, of your life, the, the practicalities of, of living, um, you know, predominantly income? Is it something that you can earn or plan for? Or is it in the way that Charlotte suggests in that earlier quote, something that's almost just happens by chance? Um, which actually would you know, be the root of the word happiness, something Austin is very aware of. The, the root of the word happiness is, is the word hap or, or luck. Um, what, to, you know, to whom is happiness given in a society like this? If someone like Charlotte feels that for her, it's actually beside the point. Um, now, that is something that gets, as I said in my, you know, my former teacher's little joke about law school, is even more complicated in the case of Elizabeth. And so it is, you know, I think in, in the time that I left, I, I do want to say a bit about the main plot of the novel. Um, so let me say this just from my own experience. You know, students tend to have two ways in which they think about how it is that Elizabeth chains, comes around on Darcy. Why does she change her mind about him? Um, and there's the, what I would say is the sort of charitable version and the uncharitable version. The charitable version is that, you know, he discovers he's really a good guy. She discovers that uh, he has been the one who has saved her sister Lydia from a potentially disastrous elopement with this figure Wickham, um, that he's sought to do it without advertising it. 
And so she learns about his sterling inner qualities and comes around on him in, in that way. The other, the, you know, what I'll call the uncharitable reading is that, that he changes his mind because she discovers he's rich. Um, I would say that neither of them is, is really true um, or are really only partially true. The couple things I, I'd wanna say about this is that it's important to point out how odd it is if this is a courtship novel in the two pivotal moments in which Elizabeth's mind really, you can see it changing, he's not there, he's absent. And in fact, that they're away from each other for long stretches of this novel, almost as if this cannot happen, their, their ultimate union without their being away from each other. There's a really strange way in this novel that falling in love is a solitary experience and it's best done in the absence of the other person. Um, now the first, scene in which this occurs, of course, is, is via letters. And this probably is a kind of lingering trace of the original epistolary version of Pride and Prejudice. Um, he sends her a letter explaining his conduct, explaining why he'd, uh, why he had, uh, you know, his version of the story of uh, the backstory of, of Wickham, presenting a very different version than the version of Wickham had told her, and also attempting to explain why it is he tried to break up uh, Jane um, and and his friend Bingley, and the letter is, you know, very convincing in certain ways, and it ends with Elizabeth rereading the letter multiple times, and it and and then arriving at this uh, particular um, uh, this particular series of of um, of thoughts about it. I think oh, there we go. Sorry, move back a bit. So this long passage, which is in volume three, part two, I, I've, I've sometimes described to students, you know, and, and it sometimes is meant that I've had to do some work about it, but a lot of students, those who are particularly trained in music will, will know about this. It's a kind of sonata form, actually. Um, and it takes place entirely through um, her, her introspection, her trying to figure out what it is I feel about this person at this moment. And that means raising some general terms and sort of sifting them as to whether or not they apply. So I've put in red these general terms here, you know, starting, do I hate him? No, I don't hate him. I respect him, but it's a little bit more than respect, so that's not exact. It's respect and esteem. And even more than that, there's something called goodwill, I think, which could apply to this. And so she goes through, you know, that level of explanation. And then she finally decides that there's a word that does work and she calls it gratitude. Gratitude is the right word. I'm grateful to him. Why am I grateful to him? I'm grateful to him for these following reasons. So that will help explain why it is that gratitude is the appropriate term, but gratitude might imply something else, that something else might be love. Um, that is, it must have been that he loves her, which is why he did the deeds he did, which inspires her gratitude. And it opens up this final question, what, where, might, where might gratitude go? from here, at which point she says, you know, it's unclear. It cannot be exactly defined where gratitude might go. And then from development, you go to what in sonata form is called, you know, recapitulation. You go back through the series of terms again. She respected, she esteemed, she was grateful to him. She felt a real interest in his welfare. She only wanted to know how far she wished that welfare to depend upon herself and how far it would be for the happiness of both that she should employ the power which her fancy told her she still possessed of bringing on her the renewal of his addresses. Now, I think that the reason to read this passage closely with students is to say that um, this is, it's really important to think about how general terms are used in this passage. She's trying very carefully to find the general term that works for her, that will accurately describe her feelings. It involves the, she needs evidence, she needs corroboration. She's looking at this letter and trying to sift, what, what do I agree with? What do I not agree with? Um, it's almost a kind of quasi-legal process. There's, there's testimony here that she needs to go through. And, and it's a timed process, right? It, it, it takes time for this. The, the news of the letter has to sink in. She has to read it multiple times. She has to be alone for a long time to lead herself through these thoughts. Um, and that is one way in which uh, you could say something like love occurs, and that's through introspection. 
Um, and that's not the same thing as discovering he's a good guy. That is, it's not about learning about him, but more about learning about herself that, that this operates. But to turn to the uncharitable account, you know, she changes her mind because she discovers he's really, really rich. Um, let, me, uh, let me say a bit about the scene in which she first sees his house. It's important, of course, when she first sees the house, she doesn't even suspect that he's there or even in the neighborhood. Um, now, this is key because I want to explain, I, I think it's important with students to explain how, yes, this is wealth, but it's a particular kind of wealth that signifies in a very particular kind of way, which is really, really crucial to her. Um, so uh, this, this last paragraph on this slide, um, Elizabeth's mind was too full for conversation, but she saw and admired every remarkable spot and point of view. They gradually ascended for half a mile and then found themselves at the top of a considerable eminence. So she's on, she's on a hill, but looking over across a valley at another hill. A considerable eminence where the woods ceased and the eye was instantly caught by Pemberley House, situated on the opposite side of a valley into which the road with some abruptness wound. It was a large, handsome stone building standing well on rising ground, so it too was on a hill, and backed by a ridge of high woody hills, and in front, a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater but without any artificial appearance. It's a really important phrase I'll come back to in a second. Its banks were neither formal nor falsely adorned. Elizabeth was delighted. She'd never seen a place for which nature had done more or where natural beauty had been so little counteracted by an awkward taste. Now, you know, from a distance, this really can seem like, well, yeah, she just sees that he's rich. She sees that it's, it's a big house. Um, what she's actually seeing is something very particular, and I think that needs to be explained to students. It, it, it isn't particularly hard to do it, but it is, does involve, you know, giving them some information they don't necessarily possess. She has noticed that a lot of work has been done on the grounds. Um, for instance, this, this phrase, a stream of some natural importance was swelled into greater, but without any artificial appearance, that stream itself is artificial, or at least um, if it was once natural, it has been artificially broadened, but broadened in a way that it doesn't look artificial or it only looks artificial to a really trained eye, which it happens Elizabeth is. So this is uh, late 18th century landscape aesthetics. Um, this is uh, a very, very, uh, important aspect of the life of 18th century aesthetics in general. And I, you know, here's a slide that will help understand how this works. So landscape aestheticians like uh, this figure, William Gilpin, whom Austin uh, had read actually and refers to in one of her other novels, uh, published elaborate portfolio books in which they described how you could remake your landscape to accord with current ideas of the beautiful. Um, and here's the, on the top is the before and the bottom is the after. So you can see how Gilpin uh, advised his clients to change their landscape. A good thing is to ask students, you know, okay, so what were the what's the difference between before and after? And it's exactly what Austin is describing in his passage. She's seeing the after version of this. What you can see here, of course, is that a hill has been produced where there really wasn't one before. Um, there's been some plantings done. And one of the things that is important to note is the plantings are done. You can see in the top that there's some, what looks like livestock, being led by somebody um, across a path. Those livestock are now largely hidden by a, a copse of trees in the after picture. One of the efforts of landscape aesthetics is to hide the, is to essentially hide productive agriculture from the viewpoints of the ground. The, the, which will say something about the immense amount of wealth it takes to dedicate land to entirely non-productive uses and hide evidence of, its, of the productivity, of the actual income that um, the person depends upon. Um, what that meant is the invention in British landscape aesthetics was something we now call the lawn. Um, you know, I, I tell students, those of, the, those of them that grew up with lawns really owe it to landscape aesthetics, the idea that there needs to be a kind of large area of completely non-productive land um, around a house uh, is a new one in the 18th century. And it really bespeaks wealth. Um, we all know the ways in which it's actually ecologically quite uh, damaging now, but, um, and even then people are aware of this, but uh, it, it demonstrates wealth, but it demonstrates wealth in a very particular way. It demonstrates wealth through 
this ideology of attempting to look even more natural than nature itself. A certain kind of idealized image of nature, but that means that you're allowing your wealth to be tamed by an ideology of the natural. So when Elizabeth says beforehand that nothing looked formal, what she means by that is something specifically French. Um, she means the difference between, um, let's say this, this picture I've taken of High Clear Castle where the grounds are designed as, as picturesque landscape aesthetics and something like Versailles, formal grounds. The key part here, I think it's important to stress is that at a place like High Clear or a place like Pemberley, what the landscape is designed to look in particular ways to people situated within it. So the beauty of the landscape is, should be apparent to somebody in the landscape. What, what is called in that, you know, in the passage at the beginning of volume three, point of view. She's, her point of view is being solicited. Uh, it's almost as if Darcy designed the landscape to be looked from the very place she's standing. So almost standing there, she's in a dialogue with him, it seems. Unlike Versailles, where the understanding of British landscape aestheticians is that Versailles is meant to be looked at from the kind of impossible point of view of God or of the ruler. Um, it's geometric. It is, uh, you know, it, it's what British landscape aestheticians would say that these straight lines are what they call fatiguing to the eye. It, at every moment, formal aesthetics is meant to demonstrate the fact that somebody did something to the nature in it, particularly through these geometric shapes, and therefore it's authoritarian. So the key part here isn't just that he has money or that he's used this money tastefully, but he uses this money in a way that is not authoritarian. He's soliciting somebody's individual gaze. And so he's not a French aristocrat. Now this means everything in the 1790s, right? He is not somebody who is going to ruthlessly use his power. And therefore, because he's ruthlessly using his power, perhaps have his head cut off. He is protective, paternalistic, but also solicitous of the individual people that enter his grounds. And you could even say that she imagines herself, therefore, as almost like the kind of nature that Darcy could also own and improve. So, uh, but yet with a certain kind of liberty left intact, her, her nature will not be overly transformed. It will be respected by somebody like this. That's a really key way to think about this and not just money. Um, now, there's a lot more that could be said about this this body of thinking, but I, I you know I think it's it's that ideology of the natural and the free um, is very important to her. Um, even though, in some sense, you know, historically speaking, that form of landscape design doesn't really win out. Um, I you know, for instance, you can show students, you know, uh, obviously Washington D.C. itself is designed by somebody who preferred French uh, French formal design, and you know I. Uh, teach and I, you know, I certainly at the moment miss it very much on a campus that is uh, certainly neoclassical and formal in exactly the ways that, say, something like Versailles is. Um, but uh, you know, in some ways, in another way, English landscape aesthetics wins in terms of private homes, um, in terms of the, you know, the still reigning ideologies of what a private home should look like. Um, now this really climaxes, and this is maybe a, a good scene to, to end with, this, this climaxes in the scene when Lady Catherine de Bourgh comes to Lizzie and demands to know whether or not she and Darcy are engaged. Um, now what, um, what uh, I'll skip ahead here to, um, just in the interest of time, to this scene where um, she demands to know this, and Elizabeth at first says, you have no right to know that. Um, she says here, you know, you have no right to concern yourself in mine, in my affairs. Um, what's, in, you know, what's important here is the language of rights is being broached in this novel for the first time. At which point Lady Catherine says, no, you look, I demand, I demand to know. And begins to insult Elizabeth. She says, you know, uh, 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 you know are, are you honestly going to marry him? Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, Lady Catherine confronts her and says, are you honestly saying that you 
you are going to marry him if he proposes. And Elizabeth's response is, I have said no such thing. I'm only resolved to act in that manner, which will, in my opinion, constitute my happiness without reference to you or to any person so wholly unconnected with me. I usually ask students at this point, I say, all right, does this sentence remind you of anything? And it often takes some time, but regularly, eventually someone will say, oh, wait a minute, that's the Declaration of Independence. Um, and it is true that this, this Declaration of a Right to Happiness is really reminiscent, not just of the Declaration of Independence, but I think even more controversially for someone in Austin's position, of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, that is um, this assertion of the formal rights to something like liberty, and liberty meaning, as it means in the Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness, this formal right that provides a kind of formal equality between uh, Elizabeth and Lady Catherine. What I'm wanting them to see is that there's a moment here in which it's not necessarily about Elizabeth capitulating to a desire for wealth or even capitulating necessarily to Darcy's qualities, but asserting a kind of revolutionary claim. And what's really interesting about this, of course, is that it's a young woman without property who makes this assertion and makes it to an older woman. I think it's important to note that, you know, in many ways, what's the climactic political moment in the novel is a conversation between two women, has, and that is not, you know, it's not sort of freighted with courtship, even if it starts as a conversation about courtship. Uh, it really is about two women arguing about what it is that one, what duties does one owe, and Elizabeth draws a very firm line around that, saying, I owe very few duties to anybody like you, if, if any at all, indeed. Um, this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, will give a sense of the social and political context, and I think will help students understand a bit about, uh, you know, what what is so important about the union of Elizabeth and Darcy. Uh, you know, why why should this matter to us? Well, it matters to us because it's an articulation of a kind of liberal ideal. Um, put in the mouth of somebody who shouldn't have any authority to make such a claim. That is a, a woman of uh, Elizabeth's uh, 20 when she says this right and, and has no property and almost no income or no income coming to her from her father, um, but is still able to make this kind of claim. Um, I know that, you know, uh, my time is really limited now, so I just wanted to, you know, stop to see if there are any questions, I guess, at this point. And I've sped through this a bit, but uh, so there might be questions. Yeah, thank you so much for for moving us through those arguments. Um, there's been some speculation in the chat box, and I, I, I'm going to pose this as a cumulative question to you about ways ways that you can tie this into uh, more modern themes. Now, you've done so with class, um, with with wealth, with gender. When you're standing with your students, um, how how do you sort of help them draw the direct connection between these three centuries as described in the title? So, um, you know, I think I, I, I want them to see this. I, here, here's one way in which I, I, I'll often talk about manners as a way of, of um, both, I think, um, you know, uh, allowing them to, you know, allowing them their sense that this is a very different world than the one they're used to, but also giving them a sense of the kind of continued relevance of the class question here. Um, that is, I really want them to press upon the fact that where it comes to manners, the people who possess manners in this novel tend not to be the wealthy. They tend to be the relatively more uh, dispossessed people in the novel, particularly the young women. And this often catches them off guard. I think there's a kind of default sense that the rich manners are for the rich, and uh, those who are not rich don't are, are unmannered. And I often will say it's actually the opposite in Austin. <laughs> and it's important that it is the opposite because the, I, I want them to understand this as in some sense a kind of fantasy about how it is that very different social classes can defuse the potential tension that exists between them. And that might be this kind of exchange where uh, Elizabeth is allowed um, 
is given what you know what is uh, what the novel itself calls importance by your marriage to Darcy, right? Um, now, in, you know, in stark economic terms, that means money or the the ability to access money. But in exchange for that, provides him with manners. So it's there's a, there's a reciprocal effect in which the predatory ruthlessness, presumed predatory ruthlessness of the upper class, is softened. That she has taught him to learn how to behave around others, and in return for that, is accorded this certain small measure of of importance that is, you know, essentially socioeconomic importance. So there's an exchange going on here. But the the reason that that fantasy matters and maybe should matter is that in a society where inequality is growing, as it is at this moment in Austin. The question is looming, and by and by looming, I mean it's really personally looming because it's happening in France right at this moment, right? I mean, the, the specter of the guillotine is behind all of this for Austin. And a, a society where that kind of inequality can't finally be ameliorated and and revolution breaks out, how do you prevent, what's a, what's a, what's a way of preventing that? Um, now, of course, this isn't you know implementable on a wide scale basis, and uh, if you can't sort of make this a uh, this isn't an overall solution, but it's an image of a kind of solution to inequality. Mm -hmm. And I do think that you know that that kind of inequality is something that really does speak to them. They're very aware of it. Uh, you know that they're they've experienced it from various perspectives, and I think I would say even in particular in recent years they've really started to become aware, not just historically vis-a-vis -vis the French Revolution, but in their own time, of the very real potential for violence and upheaval that comes out of that gap of inequality. And so the, the sort of fantasy solution here, um, you know, that doesn't mean they have to accept the solution, but they have to think through it as uh, an image of, of what a solution might look like. And, and that does seem to speak to them very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and you may or may not have uh, felt a, a little bit of a jolt. Uh, our friend Lolly Erickson, who's in the room tonight, really liked uh, and really responded to the question that you asked. So I want I want to ask you to clarify it just a little bit. Was the question you just posed, how is it that various social classes can diffuse the tension? Did you use that phrase? Yes. Yes, that's really that's a beautiful uh, yeah. uh, question, yeah. and Lolly uh, echoes that in her chat comment. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe as a follow up, uh, Nicholas, you know, you've I suspect taught long enough to see different contexts, uh, world contexts of students that you work with. How have your own students changed over time in responding to Austin's work uh, now to ten years ago or fifteen years ago? Uh, how, how are, what are they bringing that's different that you feel can be magnified and used? To our teaching advantage. So, I mean, I, I'll actually a good example is, is I'll go back to um, what I was saying about Charlotte's decision to marry Mr. Collins. When I started teaching Austin, I really had to work hard to get students to have any sympathy for her choice. Um, you know, they they all just think she makes a really bad deal. Um, how how you know how what is it? Marrying not for love. Marrying when you even in fact. Not, not just don't love the person you're marrying, but in fact, actually really kind of dislike them, made no sense to them. And I have found in recent years, you know, to a far greater degree, um, they identify with Charlotte. They really yeah. do. Um, they see this as in fact, in, in fact, they might even identify with Charlotte more than Lizzie. Um, as if to say, look, uh, you know, this is, this is the only way out for her. And she, her understanding of a certain vision of happiness is a pure luxury only available to those with certain assets really resonates. And so there's a, that changes the way they read, right? They're more skeptical about the, uh, the conclusion and tend to identify much more with those who don't feel like they own enough to access the fantasy that they see the novel acting out at the end. And, and, uh, Sometimes they identify with Charlotte. I think one of the ways in which the, that has changed is they identify with Charlotte. They, they, they produce what is a kind of queer reading of Charlotte. Um, that in fact, it's possible that Charlotte is the queer figure in Pride and Prejudice and, and actually doesn't really have much interest in these heterosexual arrangements, but, but needs them, you know, needs them for her ongoing sustenance. And uh, I, you know, I, that, that has really altered um, students are more willing to think 
about the economics of happiness than they used to be. Yeah. Uh, Professor Nicholas Dames, thank you so much for walking this through uh, this conversation tonight. Uh, please be well in New York City. Um, thank you again for your time. Well, thank you, Andy. And, and this was a, it was a pleasure to work with you and Libby, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, Nicholas did not put his contact information on the screen idly is my thinking, so please do reach out via Twitter or email if you've got questions. Please also note that Camille Bernstein, who is our TA tonight, one of our Teacher Advisory Council members, has compiled a wonderful list of resources and links that includes many of the links and suggestions that uh, uh, each of you dropped in the chat box tonight. If you scroll up, I know it's scrolling out of view now, but if you go up the chat box, you'll see the link to a Google Doc. There it is again that uh, Camille has put together. So please uh, feel free to grab that. And I also want to mention and remind you that we do record all of our sessions. Uh, this should be posted on our website within the next couple of days and you can go back and linger with it. Um, and also note that uh, starting in June, our digital library will have not just the recording and the readings and the PowerPoint, but we'll have all the associated materials with our webinars. And we look forward to welcoming you to that space. Uh, thanks again, everyone. This has been a wonderful, uh, webinar series year. Uh, 40 are in the can and we appreciate all of your uh, interest and your attendance, whether it was one session or uh, many more. I hope you have a productive end of your spring semester. I hope things are somewhat stable with you, uh, that your, your students realize how hard you're working and you can reach out to them. Uh, this summer, please uh, use that time as best you can and, and hopefully in the fall, we'll see you again with the National Humanities Center uh, webinar series. Uh, thanks again. Be well, everyone. We'll see you uh, online, perhaps through emails, but we'll see you in this format next fall. Good night, everyone.